Hey everyone, welcome to my lecture series on introductions to CI CD pipelines. This is the first of three in the lecture series and we'll just introduce some very basic elements of a CI CD pipeline and we'll also include a Ansible playbook you could run in your own environment if you want to spin up your own CI CD server and follow along with our lecture series. So just a background of why organizations are using CI CD pipelines. So many of them are looking for a controlled method of delivery of new software features to their customers and they want to do it in a more controlled state where they can test and vet that this software application works and it's not broken. So it's in the end they're trying to enhance the customer experience with the uh, product they're offering. Teams in most organizations are also trying to simplify and automate a lot of the tedious uh, tasks that are involved in integrating new features and deployment. And anybody who's done a deployment knows that if you don't do a deployment frequently, there's a lot of steps involved, configurations, and sometimes things get confusing or left out. And you don't want to be in a state where you're deploying a software, you forgot something critical like a security feature, and then you've accidentally got a data leak. Teams are also trying to test out new ideas. We are innovating a lot more faster than we previously have. And with this innovation, we want to incorporate new technologies into our products, but we don't want to introduce technologies that will break production. So we're kind of in a dilemma uh, in terms of trying to incorporate new technologies. Using a CI CD offers the benefit of if you do mess up a deployment, you can always roll back to a previous working uh, state through um, your source code management and pushing it through the pipeline and going back to a reverted version that you know that works. So you can roll back a scenario where uh, you put something into production and it blows up really badly. So now CI CD is actually two processes and we'll split them out right now. So the first one is called continuous integration. And in continuous integration, the assumption is we already have an existing code base. And if you work with an agile environment setup, you know that developers will get their own tasks or features to work on. And they'll typically take out the source code from a source code repository. They'll work on the little bits and pieces. And when they're happy with how their code is coming together, they'll save it and they'll push it into a CI pipeline. When a CI pipeline gets executed, it'll do various uh, aspects such as source code inspection to see if the source code uh, introduces a new vulnerability, flag that vulnerability and send an uh, email message back to developers saying, hey, maybe you want to check out this new feature you added. We've detected a vulnerability. Could you fix it and resubmit the code. And this is a, a, a recursive process where they are, sorry, reiterative process where they'll keep submitting the code until uh, they get a clear uh, check. The pipeline also, more importantly, it builds the code to make sure the code can actually compile into a deliverable a product or sometimes known as an artifact. So once the CI process is completed, there's another process called continuous deployment, hence CI CD. So in continuous deployment, we take that validated code package and we push it to our various servers, the dev server, the QA server, staging and production. And depending on which server the package has been pushed to, it'll trigger a series of automated testing and security scans. So the most important thing about why we want to do this is we want to automate tasks as much as possible. And a lot of people have uh, asked about this. Does the uh, automating task really impact people's jobs? Do people lose their jobs and all that? And the answer is no. What happens is people that are working in the QA environment, they mostly be uh, pushed towards shifting left towards the development. So as the developers are writing the code, the testers are writing code to validate the developer's code. So the two of them are now working hand in hand. And the goal is to automate as much as testing as possible so you get more code coverage of your code. So you can be rest assured that you are testing and you're validating that your code works, which will increase the customer experience in relying on that code working and not breaking when they need it. And also in the uh, uh, continuous delivery process, we use concepts of webhooks. So as you're going down the pipeline, you can activate other 
uh, security appliances, network appliances to trigger monitoring. So when you push out a new um, product or a feature, you can actually activate various security checks to scan that feature as it's rolling out into production to make sure there are no vulnerabilities uh, existing. Another benefit of the continuous delivery is it'll actually alert groups. Uh, so for example, when a developer pushes code into uh, the CD pipeline, the QA staff will get alerted. There's a new build available. Can you please go check it out to validate that it's working correctly? So the, the main thing right now is we need to get the code somewhere into a repository. And the biggest common tool is uh, Git. And I'm not going to go too much into Git because a lot of people are already familiar with Git, uh, especially with the GitHub. And what basically happens is when the developer is happy with the code and they push it into the Git repository, for example, with Git push origin master, there are there's a hook that gets triggered and this hook will send out more commands to various services to indicate that there's a new software push in there. I will quickly go show one demonstration of where it's been used. And this is a project called Jekyll. And it basically takes a markdown and various other text files and it creates a static website out of those uh, files. So I'll scroll down to where we are using the hook post receive. So again, this hook gets triggered once you do git push origin master. And all this uh, script basically does is it will build the Jekyll project and then it'll build the, the uh, data that you have put into your git repo and it'll put it into a deployment directory. For our case, our deployment directory slash var wwmyrepo. So when the developer is working on some HTML and they're happy with it, they'll just do a regular git add, git commit, and then git push origin master. In this case, they've renamed their own remote to deploy. And once this uh, gets triggered, it will keep repeating this process. So this is the continuous integration and continuous deployment aspect. So the next thing is Jenkins itself. So for us, what we're really keen on is this concept called the Jenkins file. So you include this Jenkins file in your source code as you're pushing it to the Jenkins uh, to the Git server, and the Git server will uh, launch a trigger to Jenkins to say, "Hey, there's a new source code that's been pushed into the the source repo. Can you please pull it out and and create a build?" For us, uh, our pipeline build is pretty simple. Um, in this one, we'll create the environment we need, which is an Ansible environment. We will also push, uh, we'll also create, uh, I guess we're going to create a development server to run our uh, WordPress application in the dev. This part right here is the stage uh, that we will ask a user, do you want to deploy this product into production? This could be substitute to some sort of testing, automated testing uh, that could be done to see if the WordPress application is validated and it's ready to go into production. So this part right now is a manually intervention, but this could actually be automated. And then if you automate it, we can actually push stuff to uh, the production environment. So that's what a Jenkins file looks like. So. Right now, we'll go through our um, setup of our uh, CI CD pipeline. And what we'll do is I have a Ansible playbook that will help us build our CI CD server. And it's located in our GitHub repository right here. So I will open up a shell. And right now, we'll just uh, basically cut and paste right here into our shell and these instructions here are also available on the github account right here so right now it's just a bunch of cut and pasting we'll do to set up the server Uh, 
Um, for this demo, we do have to have this SSH key installed, although we're not using it for this exact lecture series, but in the future lecture series, we will be showing you why you would need to set up these SSH keys. So right now, we're just going to set up our uh, virtual environment so that we can run our Ansible playbook. And I'm going to uh, use this requirements file. So I like to uh, version pin any packages I use, and it saves you the headache of if something gets updated, it and breaking anything in the future. Um, I try to avoid that by trying to pin all my versions to a specific library version used in my applications. And if you use something like NPM, you'll find that you do this a lot with the NPM packaging. That If you look in the NPM packaging JSON file, you'll see that they also do version pinning there as well. So right now, we're just uh, trying to create, trying to download all the uh, required dependencies to run our Ansible playbook. And while this is taking place, a little bit about the host. So the target server we're using for our CI CD uh, application is uh, CentOS 7.7 .7, and it's just a minimal install, nothing else added to it. So we're just waiting. For some reason the internet has gone slow and shouldn't take too long. Okay, and now we will run the actual Ansible playbook. So as this is running in the background, I'll just quickly show you what the Ansible playbook is doing. So we have four roles that we're running. Um, so the first role, I like to follow this convention where I have a common role. And these are the common tasks that are performed in every single server I build. So you have this one file, so we just set the host name, the time zone, we update all the packages. So this is something that's uh, identical to every server that's built. So the next step we do is we run our uh, get. So what we need to do is we first need to install get itself. And then we create a repo uh, called get Fortinet. This is based on a previous example I've used um, where I've configured a Fortinet FortiGate switch, uh, FortiGate router with a bunch of uh, rules using an Ansible playbook. Um, we'll use this uh, same demo in the next lecture series and you'll see how this all comes together. But essentially all we are basically doing is creating a user and then we create a Git repo and to allow users access to this Git repo we just simply copy their SSH key into the authorized key file of this user in the Git repository. Might sound a little bit confusing right now, but in the next uh, lecture, I'll show you how this all actually comes together. So this is the task that are performed to install Jenkins, and it's pretty standard. We just take the repo from Jenkins website we run Java 1.8, I mean, we installed Java 1.8 and Jenkins, and we basically start the server. Now, this is one thing to note. Jenkins, by default, install on port 8080, is going through normal HTTP, so there's no encryption, and any passwords sent back and forth can be intercepted uh, because it's all uh, plain text. So what I've done for our playbook is I've installed Apache on top of Tomcat and with our Apache we're going to use the mod SSL so this enables HTTPS so basically everything we communicate to Jenkins will now be encrypted with HTTPS um, and I can show you quickly how that's actually being done. 
we go to the files and we look at the SSL configuration and we scroll all the way to the bottom, we're just doing a proxy pass. So we just tell Apache, hey, you get any communication, any uh, request, just pass it to localhost 8080. And that's how we are handling our encryption of any uh, data that needs to go to Jenkins. So we're just pausing here temporarily. Um, the reason for this pause is we're waiting for Jenkins to start up because it needs to spit out. Uh, I got a table there. Anyways, we need to uh, spit out uh, during the startup this file right here. And it contains a password that we need to get into uh, Jenkins to help configure it. So we'll just wait till Apache has been set up and then we'll continue. Okay, so now Apache is set up. So we'll try to go to our server. Get our lovely warning. So we'll accept the risk and continue. And this is the initial screen you'll see when you install Jenkins. And then we'll copy the admin initial password here. And then we'll just install the suggested plugins for now, which is good enough for most of the work we actually need to get done. So this part will take a while as well. It's just downloading a lot of the plugins that we will need to run Jenkins. This is taking a little bit longer than usual. I think my internet connection has been saturated. Sorry for the delay. Okay, and now we'll create our admin user. And we'll save it. So you'll notice here as well, now we're using HTTPS. So now we avoid using plain text uh, going over to the server. So we'll save and finish and start using Jenkins. So now we've now completed the installation of Jenkins and we're ready to create a new job. Okay. And this is where I'll wrap things up for now. Um, so basically, we've ran our Ansible playbook. We've configured our CI/CD server with GET and Jenkins. So in the next uh, tutorial, we will perform a smoke test where I will actually run this sample project one through our uh, CI/CD setup we have here, and you'll get a little understanding of how. Uh, our CI CD process will work. And if you're keen on it, you can 
try to use it yourself but if you would like you can wait and and in the next lecture I'll actually go over this all right thank you for watching and if you have any questions please feel free to put a comment below or send me an email have a good one